Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the December 2020 UMBC Center for Cybersecurity talk. I uh, hope everybody is staying safe and sane these days, and the end of the semester is going well for you. And um, I'd like to wish everybody a preemptive, um, safe and sane holiday season, um, wherever you might be. I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker today. Um, Dr. Tim Brennan is Professor Emeritus of Public Policy and Economics at UMBC. Uh, he just retired in uh, July of this year after 30 years uh, at UMBC. Uh, he's also been the FCC's chief economist. He's held the TD McDonald chair in the Canadian government's competition bureau and served on the staff of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, before UMBC, he was an associate professor of telecommunications and public policy at George Washington University and was also a staff economist at the U.S. Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. They don't get too much business there, do they? <laughs> uh, Dr. Brennan has over 130 articles and book chapters and books on competition policy, economic regulation, telecommunications and energy policy, intellectual property and economic methods. Uh, his MA is in math and his PhD in economics are from the University of Wisconsin. Um, today's talk is gonna be particularly interesting because um, what he's gonna cover is a one of the perennial uh, policy questions that we deal with, uh, it, it, not just in cybersecurity, but in the tech internet industry generally. So I don't want to spoil anything, but um, as, he, as he discusses this, uh, do bear in mind that what he's saying today will also apply in disciplines and sectors and industry fields outside of the cyber field. If you have questions during um, Tim's talk, please put them in the chat box. I will try to triage them the best we can. And then, of course, at the uh, end of the presentation, we will save time so that um, Tim can go through and answer questions uh, in, in greater detail if needs be. So with that, I'd like to turn the uh, microphone and um, hosting duties over to Dr. Brennan, who can share his PowerPoint whenever he's ready. OK, let me uh, give it a shot here. Uh, first, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, and thanks to Rich and uh, Donna and Anupam for helping to set this up. Um, the uh, as I sort of try to figure out how to do this, I want to say I don't think of this as a research paper as such. It's it's a variation of a talk I gave a few years ago at a business school to a again a a largely non economist or non specialist audience in this stuff. So I think of it more as a way of introducing a way of looking at this issue that you might not be familiar with. Um, I do regret the fact that it's not in person particularly because um, if this were, it would be a lot easier to do the Q's and A's and being interrupted and stuff like that. And that's a little more awkward here and hopefully it'll be okay. So let me uh, attempt to share the content here and get started. Okay, hang on. All right, I think you all can see this. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, just to give a sort of start with the background on mindsets here. Um, normal people, by which I mean anybody other than economist in this context, view things like prices and money and stuff like that as ways of moving money around from one bank account to somebody else's bank account. I mean, basically, it's a way of redistributing wealth, and that's really what's going on. And um, economists tend to look about prices, about providing incentives to take benefits and costs into account, which is a, a very different way of looking at things and leads to a lot of differences in perspective. Some may like them, some may not like them. I think people who like them become economists, people who don't, don't. Um, but the, um, uh, but that's in some sense, that's something to keep in mind about how economists look at things like assigning liability and why you do it and how you charge somebody to do it and that sort of thing. Um, so let me elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, due to a, an, econ an economist named Ronald Coase, who died not that long ago at 103, um, uh, Wrote a, well, he, he had this sort of exemplary career, which is kind of impossible because he probably, in, in 
you know, 70 years at least as an academic, uh, you know, maybe wrote 10 to 12 papers in that time. He probably could have gotten, he got Nobel Prize for one of them. He probably could have gotten Nobel Prizes for three or four more. Um, but the idea of, of Vita padding was not something that he did. One of those papers is called The Problem of Social Cost, uh, three journal of law and economics, uh, one 1960. I know that because not only have I cited it many times, but I believe it is still the most cited article in law and in economics. Um, so, uh, and basic, the sort of fundamental point in it was a, was a relatively simple one, uh, which is that the reason one has legal things like liability rules and stuff like that is is to provide incentives um, when markets are too costly to work. And here, here's an example I like to use. Um, you're driving down 95 and somebody's driving a, a little recklessly. Now, one can imagine, and probably you guys are, are much, much better at coming up with amazing instantaneous ways of doing transactions electronically. But one, but the, the image I have is if someone's driving carelessly and you want them to be more careful, you could roll down your window and yell at them saying, you know, please drive more carefully. Um, here's a dollar. Or you could say, you know, if you keep driving this this carelessly because I have the right to having people drive carefully, you've got to. If you want to drive like that, you've got to pay me two dollars before you have permission to do that. There's no way that can happen. So we have to have something in its place. What we have in its place essentially is, if you cause an accident when driving recklessly, you've got to cover the cost of the accident, and that to an economist is there not to to do compensation or distribution or making moral judgments about conduct, but how to get people to be efficient, efficiently careful. How to, you know, how to be careful to the point where the benefit of care exceeds the cost of, of them being careful. And it's essentially, if I could control your driving, how careful would, would you drive? And that one can look at law in this thing, that the reason we have private property is not to is not to reward some people who get to be rich and penalize some people who don't get to be so rich, but rather just to have an institution so people can exchange things rather than steal things to um, to facilitate things ending up in the hands of people who value them the most. Now, so this talk is about applying these overall principles. How one thinks about information, data breaches, cybersecurity, that sort of stuff. We some thoughts about how using the legal system versus regulation to do this. Um, uh, when Anupam, we were talking about, they said, why don't you, can you give us some examples? And I'm not going to give you some examples in any sort of great detail, but I'll talk about some places where to find examples of this if you would like to. Um, a, a first way of doing this is through private class action suits, and I have a citation there which describes them. Um, uh, trying to show whether people were negligent, whether they breached some sort of contract, whether there was fraud involved. Class action suits, in some sense, popular mythology aside, are actually rather difficult to um, set up to get permission to bring in some sense. You've got to state certain kinds of claims, show that people were more or less equally affected, that sort of thing. And those things aren't easy to do. Um, now, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, is the leading uh, federal agency that deals with this as kind of an extension of their um, uh, deceptive practices authority. Um, if you go to their website, there in that link, uh, you'll find dozens and dozens of cases. Um, so there are some notable. So a relatively recent one involves Zoom. Um, Equifax has been the subject of these. Uber. Um, Ashley Madison, for those of you in the audience who like to fool around. Um, Wyndham, uh, hotel chain in terms of things like credit card disclosures and stuff like that. And the FTC will often go after these people. Um, uh, for for these things under its authority. Now, among the various questions here, what 
sorry. One is who gets to own your data? You know, bank credit card numbers, social security numbers, some stuff that comes up in Google searches, disclosed or not, email, telephone calling records, all those kinds of things. Um, now, a, a good question here is sort of why own anything? As I said, the point, you know, the, the sort of economic insight in this is, is that the point of me owning something, or rather something being owned is not why a particular person gets to own it, that's hard, that's complicated, that's ethical, that's philosophical, but it's rather why should things be ownable? And if things being ownable, that means that the people can buy and sell them because you know what you're buying and selling and that sort of facilitates exchange. An application of sovereign security, who, who owns information about you? Well, there's a good presumption for thinking, well, it ought to be you. Um, if it's sort of out there, uh, it's rather too hard to sort of pay every pay anyone who might have it to get it back. But in specialized circumstances, it's a little difficult. Um, is the email content for purposes of advertising worth more to Google than to me? Um, or is there much of a gain beyond getting free searches and stuff like that from Google? Taking Google as sort of the example, and this a phrase I'm sure many people have heard is the so-called privacy paradox. Everybody sounds, you know, it's very widely said that people don't like it, these alleged invasions of privacy, but that they're, they're, not, they're not willing to do anything about it, which to an economist says, I guess they don't really care about it that much. Um, another good context for thinking about this is what information should the government own? Should the government pay you for census data? Should they pay you for what you disclose on your taxes? You know, people don't often think about that, but to an economist, that's a reasonable question. And the the answer would be, well, if you were to bother to have transactions, who would get who would who would end up with it? If the answer is, well, it's worth more um, to the public sector for the things that can be done with taxes or the census than it is for the individuals, then you may as well not bother with the transaction and just say the government gets has the right to ask for this stuff. Now, uh, someone wants to, uh, to annotate this. Um, let's just say Rich will put this out, make this available afterwards, or I can, or whatever. And why don't you annotate it then? Because as it's during the annotation, I cannot control the content unless I stop annotating. And since I'm not the annotator, I just can't really do that. So I'm going to decline that. But I don't mean to be rude to do so. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the slides will be available afterwards, and the talk will be on YouTube later today. <laughs> so um, I can think of a lot of things on YouTube you'd rather listen to than that. But it's uh, uh, Tim. Um, this is Tim. This is Anupam. We'd rather be listening to you. But I, I was wondering, is there a distinction from the perspective of economic theory uh, about? information about oneself for information that one is generating through it. So, for example, my name versus the things I click on when I'm doing a Google search. Um, there, there is, but it may be different than what you have in mind, which is that if it's information that you are in some sense generating, and this is whether it's about yourself or whether it's about anything else, intellectual property to provide an incentive to generate that information you want to give people ownership of it that's the whole point of patent and copyright for example so so that's the first thing that comes to mind other than that the general principle about vesting ownership in well if it's if it's trivial to do the exchange you, it doesn't matter who owns it because whoever wants it the most can can buy it back um now if if it is costly to do that then you want to invest it in in some sense who would end up with it if it weren't costly to buy it back and that's true even for intellectual property that's what fair use is all about mm -hmm. which is that if there are uses that are of i mean the law on this is is, is needless to say a little more complicated than not written this way exactly 
But one can think of it, or at least I have thought of it in things I've written on fair use, that uh, that um, that fair use would be uses that are not all that valuable to the copyright owner, and therefore wouldn't be worth, in some sense, going through the trouble to transact, but might be worth something to the potential user. And so you have these news exceptions or research exceptions and so on. And that's a general way of thinking about them. Um, I don't know if, you know, that's, you know, that and other questions I'm likely to get here are very good ones. And people think about these a lot. And probably at the end of this talk, if, if you have more questions and answers, I've probably done my job. So, um, so with that, uh, uh, I mean, that's great, and and uh, and that's our questioning worked out. So if it works out that way, that's terrific. So thanks for the question, and um, let me keep going. And if, if people have more, at least as far as that goes, that seemed to work pretty well. Okay. Accident liability. Now, this is, again, incentives, not punishment in the absence of markets, how to get businesses to be careful with your data and what's the right amount of care well this is the sort of thing where economists are extremely glib about this if this were to come up in lawsuits the people who would be experts about this would be a lot of you people who are listening to this who could testify as to how much certain data is worth or how much it how costly or not costly it is to protect it um so uh you know, the economist's glib response to anything is, well, how much of anything should we do? And he says, well, you should do up to the point where the the incremental benefit just covers the incremental cost. Um, you know, it's sort of like that and $3 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I mean, it, it's, it's not, you know, it's a nice analytical principle and it helps with refining some things. But in terms of where the rubber beats the road, in terms, in terms of, you know, how careful should people be, um, that could be a problem, and we'll see this in particular ways of processing this. Um, now, the, the benefit of this is obviously identify identity theft losses and however much privacy violations are worth to people or are costly to people. But I'm not sure that this is really an accident context as compared to a, a very... I think interesting and in some ways to an economist almost peculiar part of the law, which is product liability. This is different from accident liability because it's not like somebody who you don't know hits your car while you're driving. It's like you went to a particular vendor for something. And then what that vendor did didn't perform in some particular way. Uh, this would be, you know, one thinks of this with as, you know, you buy a refrigerator and it doesn't work. That kind of thing. And here in the in the data breach context would be like a party to whom gives information doesn't protect it the way you would expect it. You know, banks or merchants, obviously, you know, I, I thought was thinking of Target when I wrote this. Um, and you know, Google to some extent. Um, now, one could think of this as a breach of some sort of implicit contract, and you could go, well, what would that contract be? And there you get your, your arguments about whether privacy policy is or should be a binding contract or not, given how hard it is for normal people or how costly it is for normal people to take the time to read them and figure out what's in them. Um, now, in an ideal world, you wouldn't need product liability law at all. People could just shop around, choose their vendors, choose their search engines, whatever it would be, to pick those on the basis of performance and everything else, and how careful they are with their information. Um, this is something that people do in other contexts. For example, I have car airbags up there. People shop for safer cars. They will pay more for them. 
you know, Volvos cost more than the Honda Fit I drive for a reason. And people who value that safety of a Volvo will buy, you know, will buy the Volvo and people for whom that extra amount of money isn't worth it uh, won't. Uh, and, and so the, in some sense, the market arguably can take care of that. Although you may say, well, you know, by regulation, you have to have those. And we'll come back to that maybe at the end. But the point is, is that people can sh treat, you know, can shop for amenities. You don't have to have, you know, the law stepping in to say that, well, a product should have properties X, Y, and Z. However, to say that they can do it, doesn't mean or in some ideal sense doesn't mean they can as a practical sense the main problems here the economists see and you probably see them too you might phrase them a little differently is what's called um, asymmetric information and here it involves the ability of buyers to assess claims about cybersecurity that a particular vendor might make you know Target says, I promise not to lose your credit cards. And that promise wouldn't be all that would probably be much, much more detail. I, I promise to do X, Y, and Z to protect your credit cards. Well, am I in a position to evaluate those claims when I'm standing at the cash register in Target? Not really. Do I have any sort of cheap means of holding their contract after the purchase if they fail to, to, to perform as promised? not really so one has so because the market can't work or probably won't work very well the law steps in now what might the law do in this case well there's two rough options which have advantages and disadvantages and i'll try to go through those one and and by the and after i go through this i'll talk about why to a bunch of bankers and merchants when I was first giving this talk, they thought this was all of this was horrible and I will get to that. Strict liability means you hold in this case a disclosure responsible period um, for breaches that occur on their watch. And that they pay the cost of damages resulting from that loss. And the advantage is that that if the damages that that person pays are based on how injured I am or his customers are from the breach, then in effect, they take those costs into, into account. It's as if I and consumers as a whole essentially controlled Target or whatever, or Google in terms of what they disclose. Um, now, in practice however it's going to be prohibitively expensive almost certainly excuse me to make the chance of disclosure zero you're not going to be able to prevent anything even if you're liable it's not going to be worth it to prevent everything sometimes you'll just have to eat the damages under a strict liability regime what that means is that if you're a target for example and you want to be in the business of retailing stuff that people are buying with credit cards, then that's going to, you know, holding you liable is going to create two costs. First is the cost of how careful you've got to be, which is kind of like as if the market would do it. But there's another cost, which is that I'm not going to be able to prevent everything. So a cost of doing business will be that every so often, I'm going to have to pay damages because I'm liable from a disclosure because I can't prevent everything. Now, the market, you know, any firm in a competitive market is going to pass those costs on the consumer, on the consumers. Those become costs of doing business. Target passes them on. Walmart passes them on. Um, Costco passes them on. Everybody passes them on the market is just going to do that they're not going to be eaten um which means that if you're going to have a strict liability rule the question and this is a peculiarly economist way of thinking about things will be are these extra costs worth it to people 
If the answer to that question is yes, the liability regime makes sense. If no, you might not want to do it. Now, the first cost of being careful, it's like, well, I want Target to be that careful with my with my credit card information. And so I'm the presumably the benefits of that care exceed the cost. So it's something I would spend if somehow I was in charge or could write a contract with Target, which is by assumption not feasible here. The second cost is essentially insurance against the loss in case something because Target's not going to be able to stop everything. So, in effect, when I buy something from Target, the price of that item is going to go up for two reasons. One is Target's being more careful with my data because they'd be liable if they screw up. Okay, that's fine. And the other is because, because bad things are still going to happen, hopefully less often, then that cost is going to go through too. And essentially what that turns into as an insurance premium against those residual losses. Is that insurance premium worth paying? That's a good question. Do, pe do consumers want to buy that insurance? There are some losses, although not you know, non non-monetary reputation effects where people might not want to buy insurance. That's kind of a peculiar sort of thing, but basically insurance works for harms that are monetary, it's not something that makes a lot of sense for harms that are not monetary. Just to take an example, you know, you buy life insurance to protect, to provide money for people who would need it if you are no longer around, but other than covering some costs, you, you may not buy it against yourself, you know, just for yourself, for example. Um, Another problem is that if people know that the damage will be covered, what actions will they take to prevent them? You know, so it's like, you know, will I be more careful with my credit card or whatever? Um, will I, you know, use PayPal instead of my credit card number, for example? Again, you guys know examples of this better than the ones that I can think of. Um, so will people do this? And if people are going to be sloppy, that's going to increase the burden on a, on a target, and that's going to show, come up in higher costs and prices, and maybe that's not quite a good idea. Now, how much moral hazard on the consumer side is there in data breach? I don't know. This, you know, We're not talking about just leaving your credit card on the counter and expecting the counter person to hold it, although that, that may be the case, and that may be, a you know, a, a separate issue and perhaps an interesting metaphor to think about. But that's a question on one side. Okay, if we're not doing strict liability, what's the option? The alternative is, is a negligence rule. Now, what a negligence rule means is that in general, and in this particular case, is that you're only liable for something if you weren't careful enough. In an accident setting, uh, under say a car accident, under a strict liability rule, you're liable. Period. Under a negligence rule, you're liable only if you were sufficiently careless. And so, uh, now if you have a negligence rule, if people are careful, then if say a target sufficiently careful with your data, then they're never going to be liable. So, so you're not going to have other sorts of breaches that they're going to have to pay for. They satisfied their obligations by being careful. Things may still happen, but targets not liable for them. So customers will still pay the cost of being careful, but they won't be paying you know, in advance, a, a, an insurance premium in a sense for the possibility that they may have to get the target may end up having to pay them later. They bear that themselves. Now, in principle, the target, the Google, whatever, would take that amount of, of care and consideration in order to avoid liability. And the cost of damages do take place are borne by consumers when they happen. And this gives 
me, the target customer or the Google user or whatever, the incentives to reduce exposure and mitigate the so-called moral hazard. That, that I'm not going to say, well, gee, because they're liable for everything, I'm just going to blow it off and not be careful with my data. Now, problems with this. The main problem with this, and this is true in any context, litigation of whatever sort, and this is where your consulting opportunities come up, for you all who know this sector backwards and forwards, is what is due care? What is reasonableness in something like this? Sure, marginal benefit equals marginal cost is the rule, but determining that is, let's just say, not easy. And how could you calculate the damages to determine how much care is reasonable and how much and how costly it is to stop it? What courts will say about this is very uncertain. It induces a positive risk of liability, even if one is careful. Um, you'll have litigation costs to resolve disputes, and all of this going to the product price on an expected basis. And I should add here something which um, uh, is, is something that, that, that economists who, who like this is take with a grain of salt, which is that suppose this comes up in, in a very serious accidental liability, particularly like wrongful death lawsuits, you know, the Ford Pinto blowing up or something. To an economist, the point of having that lawsuit is to induce a car company, say, or say a data breacher, is to induce them to say, we are going to be careful only when the benefits to the customers of being careful exceed the cost to us of being careful. If it's too costly, if the costs and assumptions aren't worth the expected benefits, we won't do it. To an economist, that's what they're supposed to do. If that company gets in a courtroom and the plaintiff's lawyer says to it, we have this memo that says that you decided that this level of being careful wasn't worth it. And a jury hears that, you know, that company may as well kiss their, you know, you know, kiss it goodbye and just start, get out the checkbook because then you know they're writing a check. And, uh, you know, I don't have a, a good answer to that. I mean, I, there there's a, uh, um, other than to acknowledge that it's there, to not acknowledge that it's there is to, um, is to, I think, be on another planet. Um, but it does say something about the applicability of this and the potential for these liability things for a negligence rule in particular to do what it is that you want. Now, a couple of friends of mine who are economists on the faculty of the law school at George Mason um, just came out with a paper where they advocate a strict liability rather than negligence rule. And when you Think about everything that's been talked about in the last four slides. You can kind of see it. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't thought through the assorted implications as carefully as as James James Cooper and Bruce Kobayashi have, but it is something that people are out there um, right thinking about and writing about. Okay, just uh, I'm getting close to wrapping it up here. What about criminal breaches? If someone is not actually careless, but is intentional. I don't like you some disclosing your credit card number. You know, that there's some intentionality here. Now, the, there is an economic perspective on this. It is extremely arcane. The idea is something like this. And if this seems crazy, well, it, it seemed crazy about the first five times I thought it through as well. If you have an intentional action, that involves a particular victim. I've disclosed something about you. 
Um, you know, one can think of various contexts where that 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 sort of thing has has happened. Various kinds of data shaming and things like that. In such cases, where there's intentionality and there's a specific person, there's no reason to tolerate a breach of security. You can make this a criminal violation, not something that's settled through a civil lawsuit about money. The reason being that if it involves a particular person, then presumably one doesn't one could use the market to decide whether or not I should give you the right to that information. Take it outside the data context for a second. The reason stealing my car is a criminal violation and not a civil, or is a you know is criminal conduct and not not a civil violation where I would sue somebody for negligence or something like that, is because there is an alternative to you from stealing my car, which is, oh, I like your car. Let me offer you X dollars for it. And I can say yes or no. And that result of that discussion means that the car ends up in the hands of the person who values it the most, me or this other person. If the other person just takes the car, they may value it less than I do, but it, it's but they've got it. So to an economist, you want to avoid that. And free exchange where it's feasible does avoid that. So I should say, no, we're not going to permit theft because there's another way to do it. There's another way to allocate goods that, that comes up with the right answer. Now, if you're the potential thief, you don't you might not want to pay for my car, but uh that in some sense you know the economist response is probably not going to be so as a matter of you know redistributing wealth we, we want to allow some people to steal now sometimes we might actually do that the starving person who steals a couple of pieces of fruit from a grocer for example um but as a rule that's probably not something we want to build in the criminal justice system but again, one can you all can discuss that over beers or whatever. Uh, many people do. So this implies large criminal penalties for intentional use and disclosure. Um, now, a big issue with criminal stuff generally, where it's data breaches or something else, is something that's called marginal deterrence, which is that uh, what that means in general is that once a violation is detected, you might say, well, why not just make the penalty arbitrarily large because we don't want anybody doing that. The problem is if you have an arbitrarily large penalty, but the, the, the perpetrator knows that and is still out there, they can no longer be deterred from anything else. You know, if the penalty for stealing a car is life in prison, or the death penalty, or whatever you think that the highest penalty would be to keep people from stealing cars. Once they steal the car, they no longer have an incentive not to kill witnesses. You know, I mean, this is an extreme example. And if if you know, so if you if you had an intentional data breach, somebody wanting to get at somebody else, um uh, you might not want to have an arbitrarily large payment because there may be some other sorts of conduct you don't, you still want to discourage them from doing. I don't think this is a big deal, but you all know this world much better than I do. Now, when I gave this talk before to, there are a lot of people there this was at a business school who were bankers, merchants, people who handled data. And the notion that they should be liable for breaches, of course, they found offensive. They said, why should we be liable? Didn't somebody else steal the data? Didn't some hacker get into the target system, for example? 
shouldn't they be the ones who bear a penalty? And the answer is yes, but they're not the only ones. I'm not guilty, why hold me liable? There's a notion of efficient avoidance of crime. And if one is casual about that, uh, one should be liable. Now, one might say, here's an example that just occurred to me, think about liability from a car stolen from a parking lot or parking garage. Now, you might find on the, on the ticket something saying, we're not liable for that. Well, maybe they're not at some level, but suppose the attendants just leave keys in the car, or they just leave the keys sitting around someplace and not, they're not behind something, so you have to get past an attendant to get the key. Suppose they just walk them and say, hey, give me the key to that Porsche over there. And, they go, and the attendant goes, go, sure. If that's standard practice, that lot's gonna be held liable, and they should be, because they could prevent a bad outcome even given that a thief showed up at relatively low cost. And if they can, they should be held liable when they don't. And so that's the, uh, uh, that's sort of the rationale there. Um, this too is a doctrine in the law, which seemed confusing, but economists sort of understood it, understand it, which is called the last clear chance doctrine. And the sort of textbook or legal Casebook example, as I understand it, goes something like this. Somebody who's drunk or whatever trespasses and falls asleep on some subway tracks. And so they shouldn't be there, but they're there and they've passed on the tracks. The driver of the train comes along sees this person in time to stop the train. If they don't stop the train, they're gonna kill him. The question, if that person driver does not stop the train, should they be liable? Now, one might say, if you were one of these bankers at this conference, no, they shouldn't be liable. That guy shouldn't have been on the tracks. And the answer is, yes, they should be liable because the cost to them of avoiding the, this is, in the hypothetical I described, is less than the cost to this person on the tracks of dying. Then you might say, well, if they were, you found a suicide note, should that absolve them from liability? I'm not gonna go there. I don't really know what the law says about that. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, you know, there there is still some liability, even if someone does something they shouldn't do to put you in that position. Now, does this mean the hackers are off who get the, who get credit cards or whatever numbers or whatever? Should they be off the hook? And the answer is, of course not. At minimum, if they're out there. Being out there means that, that merchants have to bear costs to protect it. credit cards, protect data. And so if some hacker tries to do this, they should be liable for the costs that they're imposing on these merchants, merchants in general, perhaps, you know, to protect against that sort of thing. They are imposing costs on others. The person who trespasses on the tracks in the train example I just gave should be held liable for trespassing on the tracks. What should the damage be? How careful they force train drivers to have to be in terms of atten attention and reaction to protect them from their from this conduct, from the trespassing. So you want to have them hackers bear the cost and you want to multiply by the inverse of the probability of getting caught so they bear the expected damages in mind which is if if one in 20 gets caught you want to multiply the damages by 20. I'm leaving aside issues of bankruptcy and that sort of thing and if that's big enough then you just want to make this criminal last slide and thanks very much for your patience with it all of this was about using the legal system to handle, to provide incentives to protect data. 
who owns it, whether an accident or a product liability regime makes sense, if product liability, whether a strict liability or negligence regime makes sense. In some cases, perhaps what their criminal conduct rationale is and how one structures that and why there's still a problem, even if the, the initial cause of the data breach is the action by some hacker someplace and not, and not Target or Google or whomever. That still leaves a, a sort of a threshold question, which is, does the legal system take care of this, or do we have some regulators issue rules as to how to protect data? Now, there are advantages of using the legal system, which is that you can be case specific, uh, mainly. Um, you can, and that standards can, can evolve. There's, and this is something that I didn't realize when I first started thinking about this stuff a long time ago. And so I'll pass this along in case some of you don't know this. I never quite realized this, but there's something out there. It's called common law. Property law, liability law, contract law fit into that category. And what common law is, is law that's basically evolved entirely out of court decisions. It was not passed by a legislature. Congress did not pass property law. The Maryland legislature did not pass, by and large, liability law. They might have modified it here in their particular circumstances. But these things have been around for a long time, and standards evolve about this. And the economist view of this is they evolve toward things that lead to more efficient outcomes. Um, and that's a, that's a controversial claim among among legal scholars, to be sure. Um, so that so those are the advantages, but these those advantages come with cost. Litigation is not cheap. Those of you who might be expert witnesses might appreciate that it's not cheap, but it's not cheap, and it's also uncertain. And that may argue for using ex ante regulation, which is that you tolerate some mistakes at the margins in exchange, you know, um, uh, you know, that might come about from, from administrative error. I didn't word this very well. Um, error, you might tolerate some error because of administrative error or inflexibility in order to avoid some of this litigation, some of this uncertainty and cut to the, and arrive at the evolving standards without having to go through case after case after case after case to evolve standards like the last clear chance doctrine or the due care doctrine or whatever, something like that is. Um, no solution here is gonna be perfect. This is complicated um, and you know, it's complicated empirically and it's complicated theoretically. And that's really all I've got to say. So if you've got, you know, there's 10 minutes left and then schedule time, I'm happy to hang around if you have questions or please feel free to email them later or whatever. And I appreciate the time you spent doing this. And if I can figure out how to do it, I, I will unshare the screen and get back to things. So thanks very much. And thanks, Richard. I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Tim. Um, if you have questions or would like to ask a question, please uh, just type your name or your question into the chat box and I will um, triage them for people since we have several that are on the phone as well. Um, Tim, this was some um, really interesting stuff, and I got to say, you've given me some flashbacks to my own PhD work uh, looking at vulnerability disclosure because a lot of the meta issues that you discussed um, certainly play directly into cybersecurity, uh, the disclosure of cyber vulnerabilities and the various issues around that. So you're giving me flashbacks, and um, I both love you and I hate you for it. Um, <laughs> one question, a comment I have, or a comment and a question, just kind of kick kick this off is. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on how commercial laws, and I'm thinking like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, might be um, abused in the name of shutting down security research to identify vulnerabilities and problems and breaches, um, and, and what that might mean and how you might maybe find a, a more equitable and meaningful approach 
I remember back about 10 years ago, there's a, uh, a security researcher was targeted under DMCA because he posted a vulnerability in um, HP's true secure operating system. And the company said, we're justified in using this IP law to go after the security researcher because he's showing how to get around our copyright controls, i.e. a login and password to their intellectual property, their operating system. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, sort of you know, that flashpoint, those type of flashpoints. Uh, I'm... I'm not sure I'm going to have anything to say about that that isn't uh, kind of glib. Um, uh, the uh, if I have, you know, I always try to think about these things in terms of other examples because it's easier for me. Mm -hmm. um, and what's coming up, to, what's coming to mind here is, um, if if I have a, uh, you know, if, if I lock the doors of my house so people won't steal my guitars, um, I'm not going to be too happy if if instructions on how to break that lock. You know, become widely available, right? Uh, and so, and so, the economist in me, and I say that not because, in some sense, I deserve to own those guitars, but in order, for some sense, to protect the market for those guitars. You know, why should I bother to buy a guitar if I think someone can just, you know, hack the lock and and take it? Um, so, in general, I'm I'm somewhat sympathetic with the idea that that uh that one uh that that intellectual property or other forms of property deserve protection um including copyright uh now uh you know prob you know obviously there's you know that's you know and this is where the part where i'm being glib shows up is that you know the benefits of all of these things are finite. And so I say, well, gee, you know, suppose if you allow this research, you might get even better copyright protection in the future. Um, and so the, the and so well, gee, if that if that benefit is big enough, then yeah, you want to let people, you know, hack into these things and, and display that stuff and so on. Whether uh and in the place where I defer to all of you on this will be, in some sense, is there some other way to do the research besides that? Uh, you know, is there something that's sort of more abstract about those systems that can be the subject of what you all do that is, um, uh, that, that would allow you to make those to, to come up with those innovations and improvements without uh, disclosing what's going on in some particular system. Right. And so, uh, and so I apologize for not having a better answer than that. No, glib, glib is good. That's all right. Uh, as a reminder, uh, folks, please, uh, if you have questions, please post them into the chat um, from Dr. Joshi. Do we need a bunch of tech types, lawyers, and economists to come together to come up with a due standard of care? The equivalent of you can't leave the keys in the car in a lot. Um, yes. <laughs> well, yes, if you're going to do a negligence rule, if you decide, or at least for conduct where you decide that the customer really can't do anything about it, and you may as well hold the firm being strictly liable. Now, you may still need these people to come in together to decide what, well, how much should the damages be? Uh, but, um, but uh, but uh, that problem, as you as your question points out, is absolutely right. But it is compounded if you're going to go with a negligence rule that involves due care. Is also there if you're going to have a rule that uh, that's imposed by a regulator. Um, there are analogies to this. I mean, I worked at the FCC, and there are certain FCC regulations where, at least hopefully, you want economists and engineers involved 
and lawyers involved in designing regulations protecting you know spectrum or content rules or various sorts of things that are that the FCC does um, so uh, I don't I don't see that one can exclude anybody and it's great that everybody uh, that that all the all of the expertise is there because again all the all the economists can do is say gee you want to know about marginal benefit and marginal cost and ask some questions along the way but you know how to measure those things is like you know the who you know I won't say who knows because there are people who you know do a lot of empirical work and try to come up with ways to to measure various things that strike me as being impossible to measure but uh in all kinds of contexts but um but yeah one one wants to have that there may be other disciplines as well I mean, one of the things that in participating in some of the privacy workshops at uh at george mason has been is that there's a lot of debate about the privacy paradox and that sociologists psychologists whatever might say well yeah that people are going to act a certain way regarding privacy but they really do care about it and they really would like things being stricter, even if they don't take these actions, obvious actions themselves. Um, now I'm probably too much of an economist. You know, I'm not on Facebook. And I have long thought that anyone who is on Facebook gets what they deserve if they get hacked by Cambridge Analytics or, or, or whomever. But obviously that's a that's a rather um perhaps somewhat unusual opinion and somewhat cynical opinion and somewhat idiosyncratic opinion. And I recognize that. Um, I'm not on Facebook either. So I guess I'm a bit of a technical dinosaur as well. Um, we're coming up on the- In my case, oh. it's being antisocial. <laughs> um, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Um, have time for one last question here uh, from Elliot. If you were to summarize the current state of data privacy regulation in North America or Europe, how would you do it? And what do you think is the best way to enforce these regulations? Oh, man. Uh, Europe has GDPR. We don't. Uh, that's that's the main difference I'm aware of. Uh, there's a debate going on among economists who have looked into this about how costly is GDPR. It doesn't seem costly to the casual user, but there, but there are people who claim that that it's burdensome on new entrants and favors big incumbents. You guys are going to know more about that than I do. That strikes me as being the biggest one. Uh, there may be other differences. I don't really know. I was kind of surprised in going through this, in preparing this to when some of want to look at some of the cases and discovered that there were hundreds of cases on the FTC website. So I'm trying to come up with what the specific principles would be and how things would be in Europe would be difficult. I will just mention one other thing, which is that Europe has a more interventionist antitrust regime than we do. Uh, and so certain um, data abuses that the United States might be specifically talked about in terms of consumer protection, for example, might be seen as abuse of dominance in Europe. But that now I'm really speculating. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. But, but as with all questions, it's a great question. Right. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Brennan. Um, Thank you, everybody, for uh, for joining us today. It is Thank just you past, very much. Just past it. one o'clock. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that these talks will resume again in the uh, spring semester. So we're going to wish everybody a very happy and safe uh, holiday break. Good luck with finals and the end of the semester. Uh, get some downtime. Be safe this this uh, holiday season. And um, on behalf of UMBC and the UMBC Center for Cybersecurity, we thank you very much and wish you all a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and email me if you have any questions. Thanks a lot.